This is the digital channel of the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. I am Manoj Mainkar and in the next half hour, I'll bring to you news updates from India and around the world, awareness videos on coronavirus by Government of India and a lot more. We'll begin with the news updates. This is the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. The news snippets. The Bharatiya Janta Party has said that the three bills related to agriculture will boost production and help farmers get better prices for their produce. BJP President J.P. Nadda said the bills are far-sighted. He said minimum support price MSP would continue to stay. Three terrorists and a woman were killed and a CRPF commandant and two Javans were injured in an encounter in Batmalu, Srinagar. Security forces were undertaking a combing operation when they were fired upon. The Defence Minister Rajnath Singh said in the Rajya Sabha that there would be no compromise with the nation's security and sovereignty. He said there should be no doubt in anyone's mind. Mr. Singh said that China has tried to change the status quo. He asked the House to support our armed forces. Today is Prime Minister Narendra Modi's birthday. President Ramnath Kovind, Vice President M. Venkaya Naidu, Lok Sabha Speaker Om Birla, Home Minister Amit Shah and many others greeted the Prime Minister. International artists made a virtual presentation on the occasion. India has joined the Djibouti Code of Conduct Jeddah Amendment as an observer. It is a group of 18 member states on maritime matters adjoining the Red Sea, Gulf of Aden, the east coast of Africa and island countries of the Indian Ocean Rim. A virtual meeting of the foreign ministers of IBSA group took place which was chaired by External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar. India, Brazil and South Africa agreed on the need for reforms at the United Nations and called for joint strategies for ushering reforms in multilateral institutions. 40,25,079 people have recovered from COVID-19 in India. In the past 24 hours, 82,719 recoveries were reported by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. The recovery rate is now 78.64%. 11,36,613 tests for COVID-19 were conducted in the country in the past 24 hours. More than 6 crore samples have been tested till now. The meeting of the G20 Environment Ministers was held virtually. It was chaired by Saudi Arabia. India's Forest, Environment and Climate Change Minister Prakash Javdekar said, India is committed to working closely with G20 countries for a better world. He added, India is blessed with vast biodiversity and ecosystems. Greek authorities are planning to move thousands of refugees to a temporary camp after a fire devastated the refugee camp in Lesbos Island. And that is the end of the news snippets. This is the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. Jyoti Sabarwal, writer, publisher, has penned the biography of Dr. Kapila Vatsayan, A Float a Lotus Leaf. She pays tribute to the luminary scholar who passed away on 16 September. Paying tribute to a departing soul can be quite heartrending. Dr. Kapila Vatsayan, an outstanding art scholar, a cultural ambassador, administrator and builder of institutions, passed away at 91 on the morning of 16 September. As her biographer, many fond memories were triggered as it was a long, unrelenting chase to convince her to document her life and times. For she had lived a life beyond categories. Perhaps that is the quintessence of Dr. Kapila Vatsyan's trajectory, both as a sensitive artist and profound scholar. She not only questioned, but also defied the mindsets that created those categories with a multidisciplinary approach. 
given her proximity to the stalwarts of the intellectual and cultural arena that is aruna asaf ali kamla devi chatopadhyay rukmini devi arundel dr grace louis mccon morley and many more she imbibed the finer nuances of feminine discourse of these strident pioneers who crossed the social barriers and altered the gender perceptions in blissful formative years nobel laureate gurudev rabindranath tagore made her recite poetry and legendary nandlal bose taught her to hold the painting brush at shantiniketan she belonged to the generation that nurtured the ideals of a free india to rediscover its cultural roots and reconstruct the broken tradition and she devoted her boundless energy towards that lofty goal here was the original cultural zreen of india who laid the foundation of soft diplomacy in the post independence era signing numerous cultural treaties across the world and formulating bilateral exchange programs building institutions she delineated education and cultural policy with her gifted tenacity exemplary erudition and critical faculty arguably a great living authority on the arts of india and a key administrator in the fields of archaeology anthropology archives museums all her multifaceted expertise facilitated several bridges of communication especially between the indian and the western arts we went thrice to mukteshwar far from the madding crowd of capital city to work in the solitude of hills and this is what i wrote in my publisher's note which i titled an exhilarating trajectory of culture we are facing the great himalayas with infinite ranges of mountains in mukteshwar each hillside opens to another the next into the next and dr kapila watsan sees those peaks as a prime essential with light and shade playing hide and seek just as mist and sunshine obscure and reveal so also in life are the moments of obscurity and revelation climbing hills and gliding down the valleys moments of challenge and achievement doubt and faith indecision and decision hectic activity and lonesome silences each temporal moment is the container of many moments of time well what is this exploration of the self it is difficult to gauge also sometimes it seems meaningless as she ruminates during one of her extensive interview sessions i marvel at her phenomenal memory for names and dates an amazing recall for such intricate details of a bygone era that it defies time and space while wondering about her faculty for historical facts and her ability to hold forth on interconnectedness of civilizations around the world the answer is not hard to find she is no armchair critic and historian who culled her data from the rusty dusty archives her scholarship is not sustained merely by the cut and dry dissertations that emanate from an impressive array of bibliography and multiple sources she has breathed knowledge she has been a first hand witness to the turbulent history of pre and post independent india she has dug deep into the soil and put indian culture on the global map signing scores of treaties when soft diplomacy was still seeking its genesis and bharat was stuck with the cliche images of sadhus and snake charmers this is a generation that worked with exemplary dedication but accomplished everything in an anonymity remaining detached in terms of glorifying the self work was their message and media was kept out of bounds the year was 1989 as a journalist one had the fetish for bagging exclusives and dispelling the silence of some eminent achievers at that point in time dr watson was academic director of the indira gandhi national center for the arts one gathered she was a tough call and it would be quite a task to break the ice and get her on record with some trepidation i made contact and she did take the call reacting as anticipated i don't give interviews period and then softened the blow with a sweet aside i like your voice come and have coffee with me she posed a challenge i picked up the gauntlet and charmed her to open up and share the precious nuggets of her erudite mind that has assiduously researched the realm of aesthetics and delineated educational and cultural policies but my f- most curious poser at the outset was why have you been so averse to interacting with the media she faced the volley head on i have just done my work 
The question of being either closed or open arises if you have taken any kind of position. I have not take, taken any position vis-a-vis -vis the media. I write, I speak, I participate in seminars and conferences. Now that is my method of communication. I am interacting with numerous people of varied disciplines from all parts of the world. That is not exactly being closed, is it? For me, encounters or dialogues at these diverse levels have been such an enriching experience because it has taught me that the life of reflection and the life of action have to be balanced and within that lies the life of your own intellectual curiosity, probing, exploration and investigation. One has to be so grateful for all these opportunities that came fortuitously. For someone who left Michigan University, returned to the Indian learning and travelled to Banaras to immerse herself in the study of archaeology, architecture, history and literature, she has established several bridges of communication between the Indian and the Western arts. Promoting the study of India's several traditions of the literary, visual and performing arts, she perceived culture as a search for national identity but strongly discounted the percolation down theory. A dancer by training, she is known to have broken the barriers that seem to segregate disciplines and comprehended the complexities of politics, art and religion, translating them into a comprehensive philosophy in litany of her books. Also as an administrator and advisor to the government of India, she has questioned the validity of specific categories and the mindsets that define such categories for she has studied the interrelation and interdependence of varied facets of the artistic traditions with remarkable tenacity. One had to wage a battle of wits, getting the original cultural zarina of India to document her valuable cognitive trajectory. I kept proposing and she kept disposing, remained evasive and elusive with gentle snubs. There never has been any propelling desire for presentation of the persona. This alliterative assertion further reinforced her resolve but failed to deter and persistence paid off. She eventually relented reluctantly on pleading that our generation has much to imbibe from her life and times. From the incipient cajoling to bringing the tome alive, this four-year sojourn has been enlightening. And Dr. Watsyan's verb can perhaps be summed up in the words of George Louis Bourge, who said so in the boast of quietness, Time is living me, more silent than my shadow. I pass through the loftily covetous multitude. They are indispensable, singular, worthy of tomorrow. So true. All that seminal work that has been left behind would be a treasure which would remain singular and worthy of tomorrow. You were listening to Jyoti Sabarwal, writer-publisher, who penned the biography of Dr. Kapila Vatsayan, Afloat a Lotus Leaf. She paid tribute to the luminary scholar who passed away on 16 September. This program came to you from the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. You are tuned to the General Overseas Service of All India Radio. We now bring you today's commentary entitled Imran Khan's Elusive Dream of Riyasat e Medina. It is scripted by Dr. Zainab Bakhtar, analyst in Pakistan, and read by Koshik Rai. Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan has promised to redefine the image of his country with his dream of a Naya Pakistan one which is corruption-free. Most importantly, he pledged to turn Pakistan into an Islamic welfare state, one based on the model of the state of Medina and on the guiding principles of the Prophet. With a battered economy, allies leaving his coalition government, internal disputes within the party and the fear of blacklisting by the Financial Action Task Force, the balance sheet of the PTI government on the completion of its second year in power certainly does not look encouraging. On the second anniversary of his government, Imran Khan made quite a few trips to television studios to roll out his achievements in the last two years. According to him, along with changing the image of Pakistan through his choices in foreign policy, exemplary management of the coronavirus pandemic, one of the top achievements of his government, according to Imran Khan, has been setting Pakistan on the path of an Islamic welfare state for which the country originally came into being. In an interview, Imran said he wants to make Pakistan an example for the Islamic world, just like Riyasat-e-Madina created by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him.
the Pakistan government has introduced the controversial single national curriculum policy SNCP in an attempt to mainstream madrasas that is seminaries under this policy it is mandatory to teach diniyat that is religious books on islam to students till class 5th and additionally introduce a chapter on the life and history of the prophet in the school syllabus of 8th 9th and 10th standards so that the students can learn lessons from his life for the critics of the ns ncp this policy change is more ideological than educational it is argued that the policy has an overdose of religion that could lead to fear of indoctrination of children at a young age by this mainstreaming of madrasas has been reversed say educationists in pakistan the mainstream students could be heavily influenced by the madrasas in the future Also these days Imran Khan speaks about the Islamic state in most of his media conversations talking about the SNCP prominent Pakistani educationist Parvez Hood bhai argues this new curriculum will in no way bring equality among school children he underlines that it is not an only an overdose of religion for the first to fifth standard students but they also have to learn the Quran its translations and also duas prayers with such an overload of religion where would be the place for other subjects questions hood by he noted that the madrasas are meant to prepare for the afterlife and the schools are meant to prepare the young minds for this life how these two can be combined he also questioned the credibility of the 400 experts consulted for charting out the new curriculum it also has to be noted that scores of books are enlisted to be banned which do not comply with the new policy according to a survey of the performance of the pti government in the last 2 years 54% pakistanis feel that the current government has failed and performed badly in these 2 years the five main indicators of this bad performance are increased inflation increased unemployment bad cabinet selection corruption and u turns by the prime minister imran khan mr khan had promised to bring in new talent to build a naya pakistan but where are the new talents as people within and outside khan's own party for many years the security establishment has been considered the determiner of national security and foreign policy in pakistan but that role appears to have become more pronounced under the pti government army chief general khamar bajwa on many occasions has tried to save the face of the government from the impulsive decisions of the prime minister and his cabinet the latest been his trip to saudi arabia to mend fences caused by shah mahmud khureshi's statement on oic even to contain the covid-19 pandemic the military came out with the national command and operation center NCOC that was deemed more successful than the National Coordination Committee headed by Pakistan's Prime Minister there are reports that discord is brewing within the cabinet of the PTI government and many members are not on the same page when it comes to Imran's mission of making an Islamic welfare state with an uncompromising opposition weak economy and sword of the FATF hanging it would be interesting if Imran Khan can utilize the rest of his term in bringing in the riyasat madina or would actually wake up to ground realities that was a commentary on Imran Khan's elusive dream of riyasat madina it was scripted by Dr Zainab Akhtar analyst on Pakistan and read by Kaushik Rai this came to you from the general overseas service of all india radio this broadcast came to you from the digital channel of the general overseas service of all india radio